Hi my loves, welcome back. Today I'm going to be doing my February books video for you, which I'm very excited about. Um, I've got lots and lots of books to get through, so I'll try not to delay too much. Here is my big old stack for this month. I've got a couple of others I don't think that I've got physically, but this is what we're starting with anyway. Zach has just delivered me a coffee which is gonna help me get through all the books that I have to chat to you guys about today. There's rain, and also there seems to be a lot of people driving up and down the street today. So I hope that the background noise doesn't disturb, disturb you too much, but this is London. Before we get started, let's chat book club picks for next month for March. Well, it's the month we're in, but anyway. I could not pick this month, so we've got two. So you have the option of reading one or the other, or both if you want to. I've got The Memory Police by Yoko Ogawa, which has just been nominated for the Man Book International Prize. So I thought I would put it on. I thought, I thought it would be like nice for us to read one of the long listers for the prize. I've heard like mixed reviews of this, like some people really like it, um, some people are less keen on it. I'll just read you the blurb. To the people on the island, a disappeared thing no longer has any meaning. It can be burned in the garden, thrown in the river, or handed over to the memory police. Soon enough, the island forgets it ever existed. When a young novelist discovers that her editor is in danger of being taken away by the memory police, she desperately wants to save him. For some reason, he doesn't forget, and it's becoming increasingly difficult for him to hide his memory who knows what will vanish next so I have the feeling that it's quite like a subtle book um, and it's not like in your face kind of dystopia but it definitely is a dystopia so if you are interested then we've got this one to read um, for March I'm definitely intrigued by it I don't know if I'll read more of the international long listers soon I might buy a few um, a few more but this is the one that I had on my shelf so I thought pop that one in and then I also picked a classic for those of you guys who aren't really feeling the memory police this month um, I have picked Carson McCullers's The Ballad of the Sad Cafe I love Carson McCullers I've read a couple of her books and I love her so I'm hoping that this will be good I've read a couple of things about it before but not read it but yeah she's a classic uh so i thought this would be a good choice as well so miss amelia evans tall strong and nobody's fool runs a small town store except for a disastrous marriage that lasted just 10 days she's always lived alone then cousin lyman appears from nowhere a strutting hunchback who steals miss amelia's heart together they transform the store into a lively popular cafe where the locals come to drink and gossip but when her rejected and dangerous ex-husband Marvin Macy returns, the result is a bizarre love triangle that brings with it violence, hatred and betrayal. Oh. And it also says six short stories by Carson McCullers also appear in this volume. So we get a little bit of extra. That is my other book club pick for next month. My back is already hurting. I need, well... In the new house we'll have a whole new setup. So, book club pick for February was The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison, um, which is one of those books that I do feel kind of speaks for itself. It definitely doesn't need me to speak about it, um, but I will try briefly. Um, but I hope that you guys that read it did enjoy it. I also want to put an even, I think I put a trigger warning on it last month. I really hope I did. Um, but I want to put a stronger trigger warning on it, it because it deals with a lot of heavy themes. So please, cautious approaching this book if you feel like you need to be. It is about a poor black family in 1940s Ohio. So it specifically focuses on one member of the family which is Pekela Breedlove. Um, she is a young girl and most of the novel is narrated from the point of view of another neighbouring child, um, another child in the neighbourhood who is not quite so downtrodden. So Pekela Breedlove wants blue eyes and this novel is all about critiquing western beauty standards that make Pekela feel ugly and she internalises that ugliness and it in turn affects the way she relates to the people around her and the experiences that she has. So things I really liked, I really liked the narrator Claudia, I thought her voice was really strong, I think she really got her point across. Um, this is Morrison's, this was Morrison's debut novel um, but you can already see there's this signature kind of poetic, lyrical, very rich language that really defines her work and makes her such a genius author. I appreciated that it's quite a short book and it covers not a very long space of time so it could feel a little bit kind of 
unsatisfying I think but I really appreciated the kind of backstories we get to Pekka's mum and dad um, and just some of the kind of additional material um, which I thought was also obviously very important to the book and I just liked that we got some of that I always kind of enjoyed those moments well if enjoyed is the word um, because this is a pretty serious book um, I liked the experiments with genre which I wasn't really expecting um, like she sort of switches voice and tone so in the backstory for Pekla's mother there's like mixing up of first person and third person narration which I think works really well and yeah in general I well didn't enjoy it because it isn't an enjoyable book it's very sad very heavy um, covers a lot in a short space of time but I did really admire it and appreciate it as I was reading. So yes, I would definitely recommend this one and I will continue to work my way through the rest of Morrison's books. I also really want to reread Beloved because I read it a couple years, two or three years ago, but I don't think I took it in enough. So I want to reread it, I think. Um, I sense that that's my favourite Morrison novel, but like I said, I can't really remember it. I need to reread it with a fresh fresh mind. Next up I have to cast my mind back to the beginning of February. I feel like because I'm getting through a lot of books at the minute I um, it feels like I read some of these books a long long time ago but in fact I did not read this book I listened to it. This is The Wall by John Lanchester. This is about a not too distant future where the UK coastline has been replaced by a large concrete wall in the aftermath of some sort of climactic event um, that has caused a change globally, not just ecologically, um, i.e. Britain seems a lot even colder and rainier and greyer than um, it is now in the book, um, but also obviously with regard to how countries relate to each other and the symbolism of the wall is obviously not just referring to are the danger of our coastlines and environment impending environmental disaster but also our kind of post brexit mentality um, xenophobia and the UK uh, attitude towards immigrants and refugees so all of that is kind of tied up into the metaphor of the wall so in this book we follow Kavna I can never say the word Kavna the word the name Kavanagh it just feels weird coming out of my mouth I don't know <laughs> and he's a young man and he's just been posted to the wall so the wall needs guards um, against refugees and immigrants and people trying to get into the country basically who have to live on the seas where it's even more dangerous um, so the wall needs guards and all young people are conscripted for a couple of years to guard the wall and then they're released from that duty and he is not too happy with being posted to the wall and life is grey and mundane and the routine is kind of soul destroying and most of the first half of the book is taken up by that kind of sense of routine not even first half I think it goes even a bit further than the half so yes I appreciated the sentiment of this novel and I liked the ending which was a little bit more experimental kind of pushing the boat out a little bit um, I know people have mixed feelings about the ending but I actually really liked it I also thought the audiobook was actually I feel like I enjoyed this book more because I listened to it than if I had um, reading it because it has a slight because it's a first person narration it always has when someone's reading it to you it feels more personal and you feel closer to the narrator um, and it has a slight kind of rhythm to it to that kind of mundanity which um, works I think if you're listening to it it's a short book and therefore a short audio book so yeah it's not gonna get too boring whereas I feel like if I'd read it it would have been I just wouldn't have connected with it at all however yes the bad here comes the bad um, it was a little bit too monotonous I don't think the world building is really there um, I don't think John Lanchester has written any other like speculative fiction dystopia type books um, because you can kind of tell he's not really sorry everyone my memory card just got full so I've had to delete some things so anyway um, you can tell he's not really used to developing 
um, a world and fully fleshing out and fully thinking it through um, because we don't really understand what life is like um, after this change we don't really understand like how a war would affect the population how it would change things it's just kind of like surfacey there's also a lack of development in the characters and there's also a lack of development in the plot um, so I think there were lots of things that could have been improved and I kind of get it because you think well it's just a short little kind of short little novel that's building on this idea of the wall but I just feel like it needed more depth um, if I compare it to Annihilation which I'm going to talk about in a bit which is also a short book um, it just packs a lot more thought in about the world and what it me what the premise of the novel really means to the rest of its world if you know what I mean and this one just felt a little bit shallow I think is the word next I have Cloud Street by Tim Winton which has sometimes been referred to as the great Australian novel um, I had a really hard time this month with a few books rating them and like properly thinking through how I felt about them so and this is one of them I kind of careened between loving and hating this book um, eventually landing closer to the latter because I ended up giving it two out of five stars on Goodreads but yeah it was just, it was just difficult to clarify my thoughts on some of the books I read this month um, so I hope that doesn't come through too much in the video but <laughs> anyway um, this is about two families who through various circumstances um, end up living together in a kind of ramshackle old house in Perth in the suburbs of Perth um, and it follows them through the, I think it's the mid 1940s through to the mid 1960s um, and obviously it just follows their lives basically and what happens to them over those years and how they come together how they argue all of that kind of stuff so the good things about it it's got very striking lyrical language often poetic sometimes overwritten and overwrought but yes it's got very striking language and i think that's what immediately kind of pulls people into this book if they're receptive to that kind of thing and i appreciate that um the kind of point of this book was to document working class lives working class australian lives in australian literature which to my knowledge and from what i've read hadn't really been done before in literature so i appreciate that kind of part of its history however um i had a few problems with this book that I just couldn't get away from. Um, the first being it's got quite a thin plot. Um, most of it is made up of kind of like little scenes, like sporadic scenes that don't really see, and that's fine, you can kind of, you can do that. Again, another book that I read this month, which is completely different, uh, which is Wolf Hall, um, also has a kind of scene-like structure to it, but it has a really strong driving force and reason for those scenes whereas this one really didn't have that um, so it kind of feels like it's going nowhere I was kind of waiting for something to happen it starts off strong and you're pulled in by the language and then nothing's really happening there doesn't seem to be any climax the ending does have a kind of climax but it's not it's not as much as you would want from it after having read so many pages <laughs> so yeah I was wondering eventually I was wondering whether the language was kind of covering up some of that because I was really expecting like strong psychological drama from it I was expecting like a thousand acres style you know strong intense drama from it but I got instead I got kind of like soap drama drama from it which is like just chucking in a lot of trauma with no real reason okay I know that I'm really going in on Cloud Street and I'm sorry because I know lots of people absolutely love this book but anyway and then I found it a bit questionable um, with its treatment towards women um, towards Aboriginal culture and people um, towards disability towards mental health it was just a bit like um, quite a lot of the time so yeah I ended up not really liking this book very much but I'm kind of glad I read it because I kind of get a 
feel for it. And if Tim Winton resolves some of those issues in other books, please let me know. If you felt the same as me about Cl Cloud Street but liked something else that he wrote, I would like to know because, yeah. I was conflicted, I was confused. Because we have a book I don't have. <laughs> that would be The Man Who Saw Everything by Deborah Levy. This book is gonna be really tricky to describe. It's one of those books. I will do my best. Um, I read Hot Milk by Deborah Levy last, last year and really enjoyed it. It had lots of big ideas in a small little package. So I was definitely keen to read her latest offering. So it's about a young historian um, called Saul Adler and when we at the opening of the book he is just being or just has been knocked down by a car on the famous abbey road crosswalk the one that was made famous by the beatles walking across it um, for their album cover um, and he is expecting his girlfriend his girlfriend's a photographer and she often takes pictures of him um, and she he's waiting there expecting her to come um, take a picture of him crossing the crosswalk and the reason that they're doing that is because he is soon going to a kind of placement thing in East Berlin which during the time oh it's in the 1980s did I say that and it's before the wall comes down so it's during the time that um, East Berlin was still under communist rule and so he's going to go to East Berlin and he's going to bring this picture of himself on the Abbey Road pedestrian crossing to um, to his host's sister who is a big Beatles fan. I know that sounds confusing. I feel like I needed to tell you all of that in order for it to make any sense at all. <laughs> um, but anyway, so kind of the first half of the novel follows Saul in a relatively straightforward way, as straightforward as Levy ever is. Um, so it's a little bit surreal. Um, we are kind of distanced from the action a little bit in order to bring up all the things that are strange about it. It can be like funny as well in kind of an awkward way and Saul finds himself in all sorts of weird awkward situations. Um, and then kind of halfway through the book we find ourselves in 2016 and again Saul has been hit by a car on the Abbey Road pedestrian crossing. So um, and in the kind of aftermath of that he is getting really mixed up. He's getting confused, um, he takes his doctor for a Stasi agent from East Berlin, he thinks he's still in the 1980s, um, his girlfriend who should have been out of his life for a long time seems to be sitting next to him in the hospital, um, all sorts of things are kind of just getting mixed up. Um, and you realise as well that in the first half of the book there were some kind of anachronistic details that don't make a whole lot of sense. Um, so I hope I'm not doing any spoilers there, but I don't think it would, it's really spoils the book. I don't think the book can be spoiled because it's really about the experience of reading it. And it kind of becomes clear that Saul has done some pretty bad things in his life, pretty abhorrent things to other people that he loves, um, and they've done bad things to him, and it's kind of about what we owe to each other um, and it mixes up the personal and the historical so that it's really also asking um, about kind of that period of history like the 1980s and East Berlin and what we can do better if we can do better human nature that sort of thing but it's also got a kind of deeper level to that so I am currently reading and I have been reading for a little while, um, Meeting the Universe Halfway by Karen Barad, which is a non-fiction book which I used for my dissertation um, and I wanted to read the whole of it, I only used part of it for my dissertation so I wanted to reread the whole of it and basically that book is all about quantum physics and feminist theory and like contemporary philosophy and what happens when you kind of merge all those things and think through lots of the most important questions about quantum physics and life in general um, like what happens when you think all those things together um, and I love it I will be talking about it probably briefly next month because it's not going to be easy to talk about but anyway I found a st this is one of those books that I think would marry so well with that book because it's really about particularly with regard to like causality and time and time in this book seems to be 
working forwards and backwards, causality working forwards and backwards, and time seems to be enfolded into little pockets and things and like objects that Saul handles um, seem to create those pockets. So I know that sounds kind of pretty wacky, <laughs> but I thought I'd just mention it because it really brings up the complexity at work in this book and why it is like it is. So I have to say I enjoyed reading Hot Milk more, I think. Um, but the complexity in this book, like I said, is, was very satisfying to me as an English literature student, so I appreciated those aspects and I definitely think it's a little masterpiece, it's very masterful. And I will be reading everything Levy writes from now on, I still need to read a couple of her, or a few of her older books. On to a very different book indeed, we've got The Outsider by Stephen King, um, which I should have heeded, everyone's warnings was not the Stephen King novel to begin with. I think it is my first Stephen King book that I've read. I did try and listen to it a few years ago but that is not a book to listen to. It is, there's too much going on and it's too long. Right, it's about a brutal crime in a small town. Um, the head coach of the baseball team is called Terry Maitland, is very publicly arrested for the murder and basically like butchering of a young boy in town because the detectives have lots of forensic evidence on him, they have eyewitnesses who put him at the scene covered in blood, like it seems like a slam dunk basically. Um, but it turns out that Terry Maitland was in a different place and there's evidence of him being there, pretty strong evidence of him being there and they're wondering how he can be in two places at once. So that's the premise of the book. So King clearly has a really confident, solid style. Like he writes really well. The first half is very intriguing, all the suspense is there, the tension, he builds it really well and he's clearly a master at that. However, and this is where the bad stuff comes in, so I'm kind of gonna give you a little spoiler, um, which I hope you won't mind. If you don't want to hear it, shut me off for like 30 seconds. I'll try to be quick. So someone more familiar with King's writing um, on Goodreads wrote that this is part of his attempt to do a kind of more contemporary crime style book. Um, and indeed, Harlan Coben himself turns up in this book, sort of. So he's clearly trying to do that thing. So Harlan Coben always starts off with like the most wacky thing like like for example someone being in two places at once and how is that possible and then he kind of resolves it towards the end in some sort of fashion sometimes in a good way sometimes in a less good way um but the problem with king's kind of attempt is that the explanation turns out to be supernatural which just like completely ruins the fun like it ruins the premise you want it to be something real otherwise it just like it seems like an easy cop out if you know what I mean. I was like is it going to be an indictment of the um, like complete and utter faith we place in forensic evidence even if it can be interpreted subjectively? Is it going to be about yeah police work? Is it going to be a conspiracy or something? Is it going to be like a, a secret twin? And it was none of these things. So um, yeah I was kind of disappointed with that. I thought there was also some like excessive brutality with the way that the boy's body keeps being described as well. Like it was just too much. But anyway, I'm not, I'm gonna keep trying with Stephen King. Don't you worry for Stephen King lovers. But yeah, this one was a bit of a disappointment, sadly. Okay, next we have In Our Mad and Furious City by Guy Gunaratne. This is another book that I found difficult to clarify my thoughts on. Partially because in the first half of the book I just wasn't connecting, didn't really wasn't really feeling strongly in any way about the book and then in the second half of the book I kind of really got to grips with it and enjoyed it a lot more or got into it a lot more rather. So it's told from the voices of multiple characters um, and it follows three families living in and around an estate in Neasden which is in northwest London. Before the beginning of the book a soldier has just been killed in the area um, I think by a resident of the area not the police or anything um, and basically they're all kind of dealing with escalating fundamentalism at the local mosque they're dealing with the tensions that that brings but also just life growing up 
in and around an estate, living as a non-white person or a working class person um, in Neasden basically. And what kind of life that is, um, Gunnar Ratney talks about the levels of violence and there seems like there's no room for tenderness, it's very hard to be tender in that environment. Um, so the good things, I, I thought the language was great. Some people find it really impenetrable. I think people that aren't British or from London, um, so be warned on that front. But uh, I think Gunnar Ratney really found the poetry and the rhythm to um, street talk, for want of a better word, or street slang. And he used it to great effect. There's differences between the characters, subtle differences linguistically, which I really appreciated. And I also like the generational aspect, so it doesn't, it's not just the young people, we also had some of the views of the old people, so there's a little bit of explanation about the Windrush generation, and um, I thought that was interesting. It also gives you the history of colonialism and stuff that leads us to this point. So the bad stuff, the plot, was a bit hackneyed, but I couldn't fully decide whether I thought it was a little bit cliche or whether it was new and fresh and I think the language was kind of the language is very much new and fresh but I couldn't decide whether the plot was felt realistic or not realistic um, there's like a rap battle scene which I was like ooh. overall I just wanted a bit more I think it's quite a short book so it doesn't really give you loads to grip onto I think um, so I think that's where maybe it fails some people but definitely an interesting one um, and I was surprised by it because I didn't know if I would like it or not but I was surprised pleasantly surprised by it so but yeah tricky to think through next we have the great alone which is the second book that I listened to in February so this comes from a genre that I rarely read I would call it romance and um, I feel a bit bad rating it because it's not a genre I read lots of and it often gets a lot of flack for not being very literary and all that kind of stuff which I think is kind of unfair because that's not what it's trying to be and um, lots of people enjoy books like this and particularly um, Kristen Hannah's work I know that she's very popular so um, I do find it a little bit tricky to kind of rate and talk about books like that because it's just not my area about a young girl called Lenny and her her and her family unexpectedly mo end up moving to Alaska in the 1970s um, so it's pretty much a wilderness out there there's not a lot of there's no electricity there's no indoor toilet sort of situation she finds a sense of belonging there that she's never had before because they've been kind of itinerant a little bit moving around and she also finds love um, but her father has PTSD from Vietnam and he it becomes abusive towards her mother. Yes, the long Alaskan winters don't help with the kind of cooped upness that kind of exacerbates some of his issues. So the good parts, I thought the evocation of Alaska was really nice. It's not like an in the distance Hernan Diaz sort of vibe. Um, it's different, but it is good. And it felt kind of, yeah, felt real and beautiful. And um, also it's a good yarn. You know, for most of the novel, um, she's kind of carry she's pacing the book quite well, and I enjoyed, for the most part, listening to it. But although Hannah is clearly aware and trying to be careful about romanticising abuse, I do think, unfortunately, because of the genre that it's in, it ends up being slightly romanticised. So I do have qualms about that and also got a problem with the representation of P PTSD I think that's tricky to talk about in a, it kind of needs a little bit more thought I think but yes and the ending was a little bit too neat but that can kind of be expected with a book like this um, but it was also a little bit rushed like we're going kind of relatively slowly throughout the whole book and then there's a really rushed ending I thought the narrator was pretty annoying on this book I think I would have preferred um, reading it than listening to it but still anyway if the, if it sounds like your cup of tea then I would go for it because it is enjoyable in various ways and it is about kind of Alaska and kind of 
learning to live in a wilderness landscape and all of that kind of stuff which I appreciate and like so if that sounds like your kind of thing then I would go for it. Next we have my first but not only five star read of the month this is Wolf Hall by Hilary Mantel the third and final book in this trilogy this is the first one obviously um is coming out this month March I think so I thought it was definitely time for me to start reading start the trilogy um, both Wolf Hall and um, its sequel, Bring Up the Bodies, won the Man Booker Prize, which is pretty much unheard of. I think a couple of other people have won the Booker Prize twice. I think she might be the only woman, and she might be the only person that did it for a series, so it's like for two similar books. Um, and this has also been nominated for the Golden Man Booker Prize as well, that's why it's nice and gold. I read this in St. Lucia, which is also why it kind of looks a little bit battered. Um, so, where to begin with this book? So, it's about um, Tudor England, it's about Thomas Cromwell, so it follows him specifically in Tudor England, who, if you don't know, basically came from nothing, very little is known about his early life, um, to become Henry VIII's, like, see one of his most powerful advisors and one of the most significant proponents of the English Reformation. He is, was kind of much maligned as a kind of weaselly, um, manipulative character, at least from the history lessons that I remember and f I think from general traditional history standpoint. Um, this is a more sympathetic portrait of him, shows him to be a little bit more of a family man, to have love and relationships and also um, someone who is charming, someone who's often kind and is kind of making the best of kind of crazy situation basically. Okay so it's actually easier I think to talk about this book to work backwards from the things that people don't really like about it. Um, she completely reinvents the whole idea of historical fiction in this book because she really, I've never read a historical fiction book before that so completely places you in its world. Like every time I would put down this book, I would like look up and just be like, I've just come out of Tudor England, <laughs> just swum up and now I'm back in St. Lucia and it all feels very strange. Um, so it really, really, really puts you in Tudor England, if you can find its rhythm. So most of it kind of takes place in the dark rooms where the machinations of power really kind of work. So in those like private conversations that really change the world basically. Most of it is taking place almost behind the scenes where I assume Thomas Tom, Tom, Thomas, Tomwell, Thomas Cromwell spent a lot of his time. Um, there's no, there's none of the kind of grand, there's no grand feasts or parties or um, any kind of extraneous detail, the, f the kind of fleshing out of the world takes place through its characters as opposed to kind of the environment. Um, although you do certainly get a sense of the kind of cold greyness of Tudor London or England. You, yeah, you kind of have to find its rhythm and a lot of people complain about the use of he and there's lots of repetitions of he did this he said this whatever he thought this and when there's lots of men in the room that can be a little bit tricky but the key is the tip is unless it's kind of more explicitly someone else it's always Thomas Cromwell so he is your guy he is your he um, and that is quite a good thing to know as you go into it once I got that I really got into the rhythm of it a little bit more. Um, I just think she, I just can't even, I would need a lot more time and a few rereads to really understand how the prose works in that how it gets you into the room basically with Thomas Cromwell and Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn and whoever else but she, like I said before earlier, it's kind of made up of scenes that are kind of grouped into little kind of minor plot line, well not minor plot lines, but the plot line, <laughs> I don't know how to describe this. Okay, so the th main thrust of this book is Henry VIII wants to marry Anne Boleyn, he wants to divorce Catherine, marry Anne Boleyn, and the main thrust of this book is Cromwell helping him to do that. And then there's like sections where the scenes are kind of grouped into other stuff, so 
I won't go into it because it's all historical, but anyway, there always seems to be like a movement towards that final goal, but it is kind of made up of scenes. And the scenes serve to kind of create Thomas Cromwell, like build him before your eyes, because he is a self-made man, a self-built man, um, coming from nothing, going to the court, the royal courts, um, and it kind of creates him before your eyes out of like wisps and scraps, and um, yes, he really, it really feels alive. There's something to this book that really feels alive. It also gives you a great grasp of a lot of the actual history, you know, in a more detailed, maybe even more academic way than some other historical fiction would do. You would do well to know at least a little bit before you go into reading this book, and you will have to keep checking the lists of characters, this is the list, um, and the family trees. You will have to keep doing that, it's one of those books. However, I think it's so worth it. It is sometimes slow, that's the only thing I will say, but I was gripped and I really 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 enjoyed it if you can't already tell. So I would recommend Wolf Hall. It is a tri it is a tricky book to just get into, but I think once you get it, you're really going to be fine. You're going to fly through it. Yes. And now I feel like I know Thomas Cromwell. <laughs> But I'm going to read Bring Up the Bodies this month, I think, because I'm very excited about it. Next we have Bel Canto by Anne Patchett, another book that I couldn't quite decide on. Um, it is about a Japanese businessman who has been invited by an unnamed Latin American country to spend his birthday with them. Um, and they're kind of hoping that he's going to invest in their country, throw up a few factories, that kind of thing. Um, and in order to tempt this man into spending his birthday in a country he doesn't really know um, or have any connection to, they get his favourite opera singer in. And he is borderline obsessed with her, like he loves her. And what happens is at the end of the evening, uh, the lights go off and they are suddenly swarmed by some hostage takers from a local terrorist group. And basically it follows these characters over, it's a very long hostage situation, lasts for a long time, a few, a couple of, a few months at least. Um, and as you know, time seems to lose all meaning and, um, responsibilities are lifted and you kind of live in a kind of strange limbo place um love blossoms and the line between hostage and hostage taker kind of seems to blur or at least friendships begin to form um and yes it's a little bit sentimental i like the sentimentality though to be honest and uh, I have no problem with that. I like the way that it explores the kind of moral grey areas of a situation like that, um, the futility of them um, in terms of actually reaching any political goals. I like the way she really thought through the ways a situation like that would play tricks on you with regards to time and um, how it would change both the hostage and the hostage shakers kind of perspectives on life. She's got good kind of human observation in there. There's some light humor. The prose is quite light and just enjoyable to read. But here comes the bad. So I think lots of people are disappointed, me included, that this book is actually based on a real situation. And the country is actually Peru. And I think it's called the Lima. Oh, I can't remember. It has a specific name. But anyway, a similar situation took place in Peru, which already is a bit um, uncomfortable because Patrick kind of dismisses the host country in quite like rude terms. Um, and obviously Peru has its own actual politics and actual real life and you can't just kind of dismiss it as background, I think, especially if you're basing it on a real place. Also, you know, this is people's probably very real trauma and to make a kind of romantic-y, love story-y type book out of it seems a little bit odd um, and a little bit questionable. The ending is really not great, the kind of little afterward basically that was tacked onto the end of the book is not very good, it's kind of like, no, 
No. <laughs> Um, and also one of the love stories is deeply questionable. Um, I, shall I spoil it? Um, basically one of the hostage shakers is a young girl and she and one of the hostages kind of ha end up having a relationship which I found pretty uncomfortable to watch, to read because it's, she's vulnerable, he's vulnerable, everyone's vulnerable um, and it's, yeah, not great. So yes, I enjoyed the book. I appreciated lots of aspects of it, but I think just the wider context definitely let it down um, a little bit. If you just not based it on a real event, I think that would have been would have been a little bit better and removed the ending and that relationship. Okay, next we have Annihilation by Jeff Vandermeer, which is my second five star read of the month. Um, it doesn't happen often that we even have one five star read, so it's always good to have two. So this is going to be another tricky book to talk about because it's kind of you have to read it to really understand this book because it's all in the atmosphere so it's about a group of women who are headed into area x um, they are a psychologist a biologist an anthropologist and a surveyor and area x is this mysterious place that has popped up i think on the florida coastline i think that's kind of where it's based on um, but on a kind of remote wildernessy um, coastline and it's surrounded by a border and it basically defies all explanation um, that's sort of one of the points so it's going to be tricky for me to explain it but strange and basically expeditions keep being sent in by kind of like a military-esque agency and they keep sending these expeditions in and strange violent crazy things keep happening to them lots of the expeditions don't come back if they do come back they're reporting very odd things happening and recently on the most re recent expedition um before the women go in people have turned back in a kind of zombie like state um they're cancer ridden um but they have returned but they've just returned in a completely transformed state so um jeff andermere is a he calls himself like a new weird author um i read city of saints of mad men last year and enjoyed it but i loved this more <laughs> um it's a science fiction book obviously but anyway um so he's kind of writing within like a horror and science fiction genre world anyway and this book is told from the point of view of the biologist who is strange in and of herself. She's a little bit of an unreliable narrator. She's an odd person. And she's gone into Area X and yeah, odd things happen. Um, so the good stuff, this book is so suspenseful. It really has a sense of like the uncanny. Um, it's, you don't wanna turn the page, but you do wanna turn the page. It's got all of those aspects which make it just good writing like it's just enjoyable to read in a kind of freaky way um but also it is so clever um it's the second book of the month which i would say would really go well with um the kind of quantum physics -y stuff i've been reading um so it's looking at science and the difficulty of objectivity and how humans are merged into our natural world but think of ourselves as out of it it's about the mutability of borders it's about the power of language it's about ecological disasters what we're doing to the world because area x is kind of considered some sort of environmental anomaly at least um but it's also completely free of pollution and humans and what does that mean it's about the limits of knowledge and the limits of what we can understand about our world um it is so clever i and like every sentence is there for a reason and serves a purpose um yes love it i just love it so much lots of people have a few issues with issues with the book because it's not really like traditional sci-fi i guess um it's like a puzzle piece this book and you kind of have to try and work it out but also understand that you will never work it out like it's there to be yeah probed basically but you're never quite going to get to the bottom of things it's the first in a series of three books um and i've just read the second one and i'm currently reading the third one um but i just really appreciate them for their 
the thought that goes into it as well as being enjoyable because they are they do have that sense of like creepiness which is just yeah which is great so yes love annihilation lots packed in there into a pretty short book so you could easily read it in a couple of days and i would highly highly recommend it i actually watched the film annihilation before i read the book i read it i watched it like at the end of last year and i i almost think it was the right way around to do it because the two stories are quite dissimilar and what the book does i think you can't do in a film um, but the film really gave me that kind of uncanny feeling so that I could go into the book kind of understanding the atmosphere. I think it really heightened the atmosphere for me so I really enjoyed doing it that way around. Which is a bit odd, I know. Okay, I managed to chat my way through one battery. So we've had to change. On to the next book which is Say Nothing, A True Story of Murder and Memory in Northern Ireland by Patrick Radden Keefe. So this book it's sort of about the abduction of Jean McConville in Northern Ireland in the 1970s, but it's more so about um, kind of the history of the IRA side of the Troubles and the Troubles in general, sort of told from the point of view of a few of the members, so it kind of gives their personal histories alongside documenting the IRA, what the IRA were doing during the time from the 1970s to the 1990s. So yeah, it's not really the true crime that it kind of purports to be. Um, so the good things about it, it expanded my knowledge of the period, it was well researched, it was personal, um, which made it kind of a little bit more engaging I guess. So the things I wasn't sure about with this book is that I don't think I'm its intended reader. Um, I really think it's it would be a good book to read if you really know nothing about the travels. But yeah, I don't think I'm its intended reader because like I said, it's not really a true crime. Um, so you can get that one off the table. And if I'm going to read like a history, even a personal history, I want a little bit more as in like one that focuses on people as opposed to just the actual events and facts. Um, I just wanted a little bit more reflection, a little bit more just theory and thought and questioning about things. I like I really like the brief moments when he talks about like state violence um or the archival issues like we could have done with a bit more with regards to like the definitions of what is terrorism and what is war and what that means to define them differently or i just felt like there could have been more of that sort of thing so if it's a history that i'm reading i kind of want something a bit more fleshed out detailed and thoughtful um whereas this kind of just covers the events basically. So yeah, I was a little bit disappointed with it, but I am glad that it kind of expanded my knowledge about the period and I will continue to keep my eye out for like historical books maybe about the period. Um, but yeah, so after that I read My Brilliant Friend by Elena Ferrante, which is a much loved novel as far as I can tell. It is translated from Italian, obviously it's about two girls who are growing up in 1950s Naples. So I think it kind of evokes 1950s Naples quite well. I appreciated the fact that it was talking about what it means to be a woman or what it meant to be a woman at the time in that society um, and the kind of patriarchal violence that underlies the whole thing and what opportunities were open to working class girls at the time and how their lives are kind of restricted basically. So I appreciated all of those elements of the book. But this book just wasn't what I thought it would be re with regards to the friendship between Elena and Leela, who are the two girls. Um, so basically this is the first in a set of four novels. Um, and I did enjoy it enough to go ahead and buy the next three books. So I must have enjoyed it. I'm, I'm about to kind of go in a little bit, but um, I must have enjoyed it enough to get the rest of the books but they do sort of feel like guilty pleasure books for me because this just wasn't as um just basically literary as I was expecting it to be I think and also like I said not what I expected in terms of the relationship between the girls so in terms of the plot I sort of felt like it was floundering a little bit it was quite repetitive and it just felt a bit lost until the end when it finally kind of got to where it was going because yeah basically the plot seems to consist of them the two girls being jealous of each other about various things um 
So yeah, my problem started with the origin story of their friendship. I didn't really understand why they were friends and I didn't really understand why they were continuing to be friends. And I kind of understand, what I, I appreciate that Ferrante is um, showing how friendships can be just as fraught with jealousy, passion, love as romantic relationships. So I appreciate all of that, but what I needed from it was more warmth and more love um, to kind of balance that out. You need to know why there's like friendship glue there um, to begin with in order to understand why they kind of put up with each other's endless pettiness it seems to me. So yeah, the beginning I didn't really understand with the dolls and the, the school thing. I didn't really think it was like a strong enough beginning for the two of them and then yeah, there was like a there was like a brief moment. I have like a really strong memory of this, but there was a brief moment where Elena says she was helping Leela like just fold some sheets, and I was like, oh, that's the sort of thing that they do. But I didn't know that because you're not showing me all those little moments of friendship that really bring people like those little tiny intimacies. Um, they can be boring like that. I don't mind if you want to <laughs> talk about folding sheets together. I'm happy with that. Um, but you just need those little kind of moments of warmth and kind of family-like love uh, that I just didn't get at all in pretty much the rest of the plot. So yeah, it just seemed to be that they were jealous of each other all the time and not a lot of love there. Maybe that's the point. I understand also that they are living in a society which is um, itself brought by violence and personal relationships are um, difficult to maintain in that world but still you just need a little bit more of the love and the warmth I think um, at least I did and maybe maybe it just wasn't for me like it just wasn't a depiction of the kind of friendship that I was expecting so I was a little bit disappointed by this one but I will continue to read the rest of the Neapolitan novels. Another book I don't have physically is A Long Petal of the Sea by Isabel Allende. This is her newest book, she's quite a famous Latin American author. It's about, well it was inspired by, she writes at the beginning of the book, it was inspired by her friend Victor, or her acquaintance Victor, who was a Spanish man. Um, he fled from Franco in, just before the Second World War um, into France and then ended up having to flee France because of the Second World War um, for Chile and then um, in the 1970s after building a life in Chile he had to flee General Pinochet's um, coup there um, for Venezuela. So it's about kind of him and his experience living this crazy life where he's kind of constantly beset by dictatorships and war um, and trying to maintain a family and love connections through all of that um, so it's like a generational story as well and it's about kind of how you feel as well I think being someone that is um, kind of torn across the world in terms of where your heart is and where you feel a sense of belonging and what that means and all of that kind of stuff so the good bits I mean in terms of the history that's extremely interesting and I don't really know much about some of those elements of history um, so I found that really interesting um, it was like good old old-fashioned historical fiction um, it's got a really startling opening scene which I don't think I will forget anytime soon and yeah it really gets its thrust after about 50 pages it took me a while to get into it and then I was like oh I understand what we're doing here we're like we're moving. The things that didn't like kind of really elevate it for me I think was that it really sped through a lot of stuff like it's only about just over 300 pages long but it's obviously getting through decades and decades worth of history and like a crazy period of time so you kind of fly through it which in itself is sort of enjoyable because it's, it never really like bogs you down with detail you don't need or all of that kind of stuff but it just means that I wasn't like really enthralled by it in the way that I am about some of my longer books um, or like Wolf Hall or something for example which you know there's more there to grasp onto if you know what I mean but it's still worth reading if any of that sounds interesting to you okay final book to chat about is Golden Hand by Garth Nix um, this is a bit of a nostalgic read for me, it's a young adult novel. I loved the Apostle trilogy when I was a kid, loved, loved, loved it, and I still 
imagine that that is a pretty great trilogy especially for young adults so yeah it's a bit of a nostalgia trip for me this book um, and then a few years ago I realized that he'd actually written kind of follow-up books um, which is Clariel and this one um, Gold Hand and I read Clariel a few years ago and really didn't enjoy it and I was like oh, what a disappointment so that's why this one has been kind of languishing on my shelf um, and didn't get rid of all of last year during my challenge thing um, because I'm just like I was just nervous that it would be equally bad um, anyway but this one was better there was more action there was more going on it was more a return to the things that I loved about the first book which is it's really unique world building really unique magic system um, which still to this day I don't think is is up there with more unique um, worlds that I have come across in my kind of speculative fiction reading um, this book follows on from the trilogy trilogy so Clariel was a um, prequel and this one works better because it is actually part of kind of the current world is interesting and enjoyable you know it's a young adult novel so I didn't really know how to rate it because I'm obviously a very different reader these days um, the ending felt a bit rushed and there seemed to be a lot of preamble but in general I enjoyed it um, I do think it was not really a necessary addition um, and I kind of wish he hadn't written both the books because they are kind of loosely linked and like I think it just works well as a standalone set of three books um, but yes I enjoyed it anyway and I'm glad I've read it and I can complete that in my mind because um, it would have annoyed me if I hadn't. So yes, that is all of February's books. I hope that you guys enjoyed this video. I hope I wasn't chatting too much shit. Thank you guys for watching. Lots more fun books to come next month, I think. And I hope you enjoy the book club books as well. Thank you for watching, guys. Bye.